My name is Siegfried Wilber. I'm Caucasus Projects Manager of the British Peace Organization Conciliation Resources, which today, supported by the European Union, is organizing this event. As you have seen, um, we start our um, dedicated to the book of Thomas Duval um, evening with a panel discussion with three interesting participants. Um, conciliation Resources, to give a short overview, has been working in the South Caucasus for more than a decade, in particular in the nagorno karabakh context. And we are trying to include marginalized people, people who have not a strong voice, into the peace process, as well as uh, we are trying to produce new food for thought, new analysis, and also challenge narratives. Um, that is why we decided to support the newly edition, new edition of the Russian version of Black Garden, Tom Deval's masterpiece on Nagorno Karabakh. And that is also why we decided to not only have a book presentation today, but also discuss the current state of affairs around Nagorno Karabakh and to have a photo exhibition in a complement, which you will later on see as well. Our participants in the discussion, which we propose obviously to hold in English, um, are Thomas de Bang, the author of the book I had mentioned. He's a well-acknowledged journalist, political analyst, and currently works for the Carnegie Endowment in Washington. Welcome, Tom. Um, to my left is Mr. Tabib Husseinov. Um, he's one of the leading Azerbaijani experts on the nagorno karabakh context. He has for many years worked in this field for the International Crisis Group and at the moment is director for the Caucasus program um, of Safer World, a British NGO. And Mr. Tatul Hakopian, a famous journalist in Armenia. He works as analyst for Civilnet and for Civilitas, a think tank. He's also author of a number of books dedicated to Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenian-Turkish relations. We propose to I have a few entrance questions, um, which I will post, and later on open up the discussion to everyone here. Um, well, Tom, your book um, was written actually in 2003. And you Published in 2003, yes. Yeah, and you decided yeah. to um, make a new edition, a follow-up, mm -hmm. 10 years after. So my question would be, what has changed in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. and what are the new conclusions that you are drawing in the new edition? Right. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Siegfried. I'm very glad to be here um, and here in, in Tbilisi. And um, I look forward to discussing the new edition of the book. And I'm also very glad to be with uh, Tatul and, and Tabib. Um, yes, indeed. The, the, the I little, I, I guess, did I expect um, that there would be a new edition um, of the book. Um, I actually did the research uh, for this book in the year uh, 2000. Um, and um, by the way, I'm speaking English, but um, если вы хотите задавать вопрос по-русски, я отвечу по-русски. And if you ask a question in English, I will answer in English. I'm, I'm sure the same is true of, of, of Tabib and, uh, and Tatul. Um, so um, the um, research was done in the year 2000, and then um, the book came out in 2003. And we decided with my publisher that it was time to update uh, the book because it, it still seems to be a valuable source in English about the Karabakh conflict. Um, I think no one else, it seems, was crazy enough to want to spend so much time um, on both sides of the conflict uh, to write another book. Um, the only, I think the only comparable book is actually by, by Tatul on my right on the book black and green, or was it green and black? I always forget, green and black, I think, um, which is an excellent uh, and a very, very interesting book. But of course, uh, for obvious reasons, Tatul doesn't have access to the uh, Azerbaijani side like I do. Um, um, what, what's changed in the last 10 years? Well, I think the main thing that's changed is, is it's the, the, the conflict I described at the beginning of the book is a kind of Soviet conflict and a post-Soviet conflict. Let's. Uh, let's not forget that this, basically, this conflict was the first in the Soviet Union in the, in the Gorbachev period. It started in 1988, when things were still quiet in Georgia and the Baltics. It was the first conflict, so it was it was very much a conflict um, of Soviet times, of Soviet political dispute, and then of Soviet weapons um, when it started in in 91. Um, so the conflict I'm describing as a kind of 
low technology conflict between two Soviet republics, really, um, with um, Karabakh, obviously, in the middle. Um, what's changed in the last decade is um, that Armenia and Azerbaijan have become full, proper states. Obviously, they st still um, have their problems. Armenia is still very dependent on Russia, but they are still two strong, full, independent states. The conflict has become a conflict between uh, two states. It's no longer a post-Soviet uh, conflict. I think that's the main thing. To, first thing to say. The second thing to say is Azerbaijan that I visited in 1995, um, its GDP, I think, was something like three or four billion dollars. Azerbaijan today has a GDP of 70 billion dollars. So it's a completely different world in Azerbaijan. Um, we can discuss how badly that money has been spent, but that money has put Azerbaijan on the map as, as, as a country, as a state. A lot of that money has obviously gone on weapons. Azerbaijan now spends more on its military budget than Armenia spends on its state budget. So the balance has, has, has tipped from in it back towards the, the losing side in the conflict of the 90s. Um, I would say the, the chief reason why Azerbaijan lost the conflict of the 90s was that Azerbaijan wasn't really a proper state. Um, it didn't have a proper army. The Armenians were, were much better organized in that period. Azerbaijan is now, um, in many ways, a stronger state uh, than Armenia. But of course, it's still the losing side uh, in the conflict. So this is the paradox uh, that we have. And we also see this, I see this in Washington. There's an information on the informational side. The Armenian side was much stronger in the 90s. And now the Azerbaijani side is spending a lot of money on PR, on information. You travel on the metro in Washington, DC, and you see a poster about Khojali, uh, which is quite incredible. Um, but you know everything changes in that respect, but nothing changes in the sense that on the ground, I think the, the conflict is, is still basically uh, the same conflict about the same issues and, and, the, and the main unresolved issue, the status of, of Karabakh. So a lot of everything has sort of changed in the international context, and yet the, the core of the problem is, is, is one that everyone knew right from the beginning in February 1988. This is, this is the paradox. It's the status of, of Karabakh, which is still um, the core uh, of the conflict. So that, that in, in a few words, is, 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 is kind of my update on the last 10 years. Thank you. Before I ask Tabib to give his viewpoint, I would also welcome our colleague Michael Mirziashvili, and we have to inv in involve you more in our round, because we are happy to have a Georgian expert to join us. Um, Michael has long-term experience in civil society work in the Caucasus. He's one of the co-founders of Studio Ray in Tbilisi. For many years he worked for the Open Society Foundation, and in the last years he was coordinating the so-called Black Sea Peace Building Network, which is an initiative of Marti Artisali's Crisis Management Initiative in Helsinki. Hello, Michael. Um, Tabib, what is your viewpoint on the situation? Why are we at the point that we are now? Thank you very much, Sergei. Uh, well, first of all, I'm very pleased to see the room so full. It really means that uh, there is a big interest to the Karabakh conflict. There is a big interest to Tom's uh, book, uh, the new edited version of, of the book, uh, and it's, it's, it's a pleasure. So I can see people, Georgians, Armenians, uh, Azerbaijanis in this room, and uh, that basically gives me a hope that people are, not, uh, are still interested. And as long as we are interested in this conflict, or rather in its resolution, uh, there is always a hope. But what has changed in the last 10 or even 20 years, I would say, um, uh, we've been talking about the conflict yesterday as part of the PNK discussions. Uh, and uh, I, I, al I also said uh, one thing that I want to repeat here, that unfortunately, do, if we look back to 20 years since the ceasefire uh, has been agreed between the sides, um, not much has been changed. Uh, Armenians and Azerbaijanis are still locked in a vicious cycle of conflict. Uh, they cannot really find a common platform around which the moderate voices of Armenians and Azerbaijanis will be able to unite. Um, there is a very strong ongoing information warfare between Armenian and Azerbaijani states, Armenian and Azerbaijani diasporas, and Armenian and Azerbaijani public in general. 
Internet is one of the main battlefields, unfortunately, for this inf information warfare. And many young people, instead of uh, you, talking to each other and trying to understand each other, they actually get infused with, with that hatred that comes from both sides. Uh, and in a way, I would say that conversation that is ongoing on internet in many international also avenues, it does not really uh, facilitate building uh, relations and building trust between the sides, but rather it, it helps build uh, knowledge of the conflict, which is good, but at the same time it also helps them to build argumentation and to basically come up with more and more sophisticated ways of battling with each other on an informational side. And this is unfortunate because, again, 20 years, I have to stress again, is a long time. And I don't, I personally wouldn't want to leave this conflict to the future generations, to my uh, children, to, to the generation that comes after us. But at the same time, when we look at the situation on the ground, we see that the arms race is ongoing, uh, information warfare is ongoing, occupation is ongoing, uh, the discourses on both sides and ant antagonism uh, on both sides is growing. Uh, and basically we see almost no, uh, no light at the end of this tunnel at the moment. Uh, however, I, I don't want to be completely pessimistic. I think that uh, during these 20 years there has been some very modest achievements as well both on the track one and track two levels. Um, on track two levels, let me start with this one. Um, although uh, the civil societies have largely failed, Armenian and Azerbaijani civil societies have largely failed to come up with a common vision and a common platform around which the moderate voices would unite. Uh, but still, we still have some small group of Armenians and Azerbaijanis who regularly meet with each other and who try to solve the conflict by discussion. Again, they have not reached any conclusion, any solution yet, and uh, the civil society is not a panacea. The track to efforts cannot really substitute the peace process entirely. But still, we have a common space, uh, which is small, but still uh, existing, uh, which allows Armenians and Azerbaijanis to come together. And over time, um, people have basically learned to talk about their differences in a civilized manner. Uh, on track one level, um, there is, um, as many of you may know, there is an ongoing discussion around uh, the so-called basic principles or Madrid principles. And uh, basically, uh, these principles or modifications of them have been in discussion table ever since mid-2000s, at least since 2005 onwards. And um, fundamentally, this is, the, um, this is the only proposal from the Minsk group so far which have not been rejected by either side of the conflict. So, in a way, if you look at the past uh, cycle of negotiations, uh, there have been different proposals uh, tabled by the OEC means group, but these proposals were rejected either by Armenian side or Azerbaijani side shortly afterwards. Uh, there has been no proposal that would, fund that would be fundamentally acceptable to both sides. Whereas now we have a situation when Armenian and Azerbaijani parties, uh, or let's say official Baku and official Yerevan, they actually say that they fundamentally and in principle agree to the basic principles. This is, I think, Im important. Um, however, they also uh, un underline that there are, the devil is in the details and uh, they are unable to bridge the gap uh, between themselves when it comes to these details. Uh, so I think that the very fact that Armenian and Azerbaijani negotiators are not rejecting these principles basically gives a signal, uh, it certainly gives a signal to me that fundamentally Armenians and Azerbaijanis can find uh, a negotiated solution using these basic principles as a general framework. However, the task for us, the task for the negotiators on the track one level, and also I would argue the task for the track two as a facilitator um, as a facilitating actor to the track one processes, 
should be to focus more on the uh, basic principles, to have more discussions, constructive dis discussions around these principles, and try to come uh, to find some points of convergence, um, some points of convergence that can be used by the negotiators to move the process forward. Um, so it's not going to be an easy task, but I think that uh, the, the, the very fact that track two is informal, we, we are kind of not formal people, so we can, uh, when, when discussing certain things, especially experts, Armenians and Azerbaijanis, when they discuss certain issues that are being discussed on the negotiation table, they can be more flexible because they are not officials. But the ideas generated in these discussions, they can certainly feed into the official negotiation table. Um, uh, negotiation process. Um, so it's uh, we're in a situation when you know um, the geopolitical situation also around Nagorno-Karabakh and around the region in, in general is not positive. Uh, the Ukraine crisis has uh, basically put the world almost on the brink of a new Cold War without exaggeration. Uh, we're on the brink of a new Cold War and I very much wish that this will not be the case. But um, another light of hope for me is that if we look at Western and Russian uh, positions and interests on Nagorno-Karabakh, we will see that fundamentally uh, the positions are actually not clashing with each other. Both uh, European Union, United States and Russia all of them are actually, when it comes, they may disagree on Georgia or on Georgian conflicts, they may disagree on Ukraine, they may disagree on many other things, on Syria, on other issues. But when it comes to Nagorno-Karabakh, we see that they are actually acting more in tandem uh, and in a more coordinated manner, although not very well, but they fundamentally do not clash with, with each other. They do not have fundamentally opposing viewpoints when it comes to uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And I would argue that Nagorno-Karabakh conflict could be one of the small issues around which the West and, uh, and uh, Russia can uh, constructively cooperate. Uh, because both of them, just like Armenians and Azerbaijanis, are fundamentally interested in preventing another outbreak of full-scale hostilities. And they are, they are interested in preventing that, out, uh, that hostilities precisely because um, the, the consequences of a new war in Nagorno-Karabakh would be very, very unpredictable. Uh, they would be highly unpredictable for Armenian and Azerbaijani peoples, and they would be also highly unpredictable for the Western and Russian interests. Specifically on Russia, there is a, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm complete, uh, finishing, but on Russia there is a very strong uh, tendency in the South Caucasus expert community to criticize Russia always, and uh, Russia basically needs to be, to, to be criticized, especially for many things that it does currently in Ukraine. But um, we should also be focusing on what is our responsibility in continuing the conflict. Russia or any other external actor can only facilitate or contribute, but the primary burden of continuing this conflict today, still after 20 years of the ceasefire, lies on our shoulders, on the shoulders of the peoples. Uh, we, if we argue that we are being manipulated, it's the primary, the primary responsibility lies on ourselves. We, we allow ourselves to be manipulated uh, and to be al uh, we allow basically this conflict to be manipulated and be used for, uh, for the interests that do not correspond to our own interests. So the call from me to Armenians and Azerbaijanis is really let's <coughs> Let's understand that we're not going to leave this region, Armenians and Azerbaijanis, we're destined to live together, and we need to find a modus vivendi, um, a way to live in Nagorno-Karabakh peacefully, uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Armenia, in Azerbaijan, uh, peacefully. Otherwise, we're just condemning ourselves to live just like Arabs and Israelis, and continuing this conflict for generations. Do we, do we really, we need to ask ourselves a straightforward question, do we need to replicate that Middle Eastern experience in our region, or do we want to move forward? I think if we straightforwardly ask uh, ourselves this question, the answer will be very clear. Thank you, Tabib. You touched upon a lot of interesting issues. I would now like to, of course, ask our colleague from Yerevan, 
Tattoo about his opinion. Yeah, he talked about the basic principles about things that are on the table that is known for everybody. So obviously a compromise is missing. There was a time in, in Armenia that one president, Levon Tepetusian, he was close to make a compromise. The society was against it. Which is, is which is not true. Which is not true. <laughs> so what is, what is your position on the current status? What's your is, truth? If a compromise is possible and if not, why not at the very moment? Thank you, Ziggy. Thank you, our colleagues, and thank you, you. Uh, my name is Tatul Hakopian. I'm a reporter. I will be very short and uh, and well. Uh, if you really want a solution, when I when I when I say solution, I mean a I mean a paper. I mean a paper, this kind of paper, which holds three signatures. Because uh, in Armenia, uh, especially in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, many many people think that that this status quo also a solution. So. But uh, really, if we want a solution, uh, I understand a, a, a paper an agreement which holds three signatures, Yerevan, Stepanakert, and Baku. So if, if the mediators, the Minsk group co-chairs, international community uh, wants to know that Armenians and Azerbaijanis are ready for compromises, that Armenians are, and Azerbaijanis are ready uh, to, to pay a price for a peace, they should ask two simple, very simple questions to, uh, to Armenians and Azerbaijanis. First, they should ask Mr. Ilham Aliyev, are you ready in some way to recognize that Nagorno-Karabakh plus a corridor with a certain width will no longer be part of Azerbaijan. If Mr. Aliyev will say yes, I am ready, the negotiator should find a, should find a way to in, in a way to to uh, to present it to Azerbaijani public. Then, if Mr. Aliyev says yes, we are ready that solution. Then they should ask Armenian and Nagorno-Karabakh authorities or Serge Sarkisyan and Bako Sahakyan that Mr. Aliyev is ready for this kind of compromises. But from the other hand, are you ready to withdraw from the territories around Nagorno-Karabakh? And if Armenians say yes, then uh, that, that means that the parties involved are ready for compromises. So, uh, Tabib, my colleague Tabib, uh, touched upon uh, Madrid principles. Yes, that, that, that principles. Uh, that principles uh, worked out back to 2004 during the first meeting in Prague, that first called Prague process, then Madrid, that now updated Madrid. Well, uh, there are 14, 15 uh, points, articles in that document, and the main six uh, are now obvious. We all know that. But the problem is that the devil, uh, uh, the devil is in details. How, 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 uh, in a way to solve the uh, so, uh, to solve the problem of uh, status quo and and uh, and uh, and referendum. Uh, as you know, the Madrid document, uh, Madrid document has uh, four, let us say, four main, uh, four main. Uh, Four main principles that are in that in that uh, draft paper. First one is the status status uh, of Nagorno-Karabakh. Well, as you know, for Armenians and Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Armenians uh, status means that Nagorno-Karabakh will never be part of Azerbaijan. For Azerbaijanis, Azerbaijan status means that. Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh will be a part of Azerbaijan with the widest, uh, widest uh, autonomy uh, existed in the world. This is the first. This is the uh, the main uh, the main conflicting uh, article, conflicting point. And in in that document, in Madrid document, I think that that in a way 
uh, the mediators try, try to, in some way, to reconcile these two contradicting principles, principle of self-determination and, 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 uh, and territorial integrity. There are also uh, important uh, issues in that document, uh, uh, like territories, refugees, security, communication. And now uh, the parties are, um, let, uh, yeah, uh, in, the Madrid or updated Madrid document uh, lays on the table, uh, but uh, uh, as I said, uh, the devil is, is, in, is in details. Uh, coming back to, to, to my understanding, what kind of, uh, what kind of ways we can, uh, uh, to the, uh, what kind of, what kind of um, solutions uh, we, we, we can have? I think uh, there, are four, there are four solutions for the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. First one, war. War, second one is status, well, you know that uh, Armenia and uh, Nagorno-Karabakh don't want a new war. I think Azerbaijan also. But Azerbaijan continues war rhetoric. The second option is status quo. But uh, this solution is unacceptable for Azerbaijan because in, in, this, in this situation, Azerbaijani, uh, Azerbaijani side, side in some ways is humiliated. The third, the third way is negotiations and negotiated solution. This is the best way. And I would like to mention one more, one more way this, uh, which I called uh, uh, peace enforcement. And we can say that the, this third and the fourth solutions are so close. By the way, I'm not against uh, to use uh, peace enforcement if the international community uh, uh, thinks that the, the sites are so closed and, and they need uh, one more push and pressure in order to, to have that negotiated solution and uh, to, have a, uh, to have an agreement. Uh, to have an agreement. Uh, what kind of obstacles we have uh, now? First of all, as I mentioned, is the war rhetoric. Uh, everywhere I'm, I'm, I'm stressing that, that if the international, uh, international community, even if uh, Jesus Christ will present the most balanced, the most, uh, you know, just and creative solution in this atmosphere of war rhetoric, in this atmosphere of hatred, that solution will not work. Uh, there are also a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of obstacles such as snipers. As you know, since 1994, since May 1994, Armenians lost in Karabakh, in, in, in Armenian-Azerbaijani line of contact, uh, approximately or more than, now more than 1,000 soldiers. And according as my Azerbaijani colleagues claim, they, they lost uh, nearly 3,000, which, mean which, which means that uh, the war actually is, well, or the situation, uh, neither war nor peace, uh, we are close to war, not to peace, because 4,000 soldiers and uh, 4,000 uh, families lost their uh, last one. Uh, also, uh, there is a lack of, lack of confidence. Several weeks ago, I was invited in one of the European capitals to discuss the Karabakh issue, and, and uh, during that discussion, one of the because uh, they are the, uh, the, there was a uh, rule of Chatham House, that's why I can't mention any name. But uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, diplomats who involved in the negotiation process uh, said that during the uh, during the uh, talks during the negotiation between uh, between Mr. Edward Nalbandian, Edward Nalbandian is the foreign minister of Armenia, and Elmar Mamadyarov. Uh, Mr. Mamadyarov is the foreign minister of Azerbaijan. Uh, they are kidding each other. You know, they, uh, they, uh, they. Uh, for example, if uh, the negotiation process continues for two hours, one hour, they, they, they kidding each other. 
So there is a lack of uh, confidence between the sides. And one more thing, and I would like to, to finish my short presentation. You know, uh, now we can say that we are, uh, we are so far from the solution. Uh, for, because the Armenian and Azerbaijani societies are not ready for compromise. Yes, we Armenians, Azerbaijanis, are ready. They don't want to kill each other. They want peace, but they, they are not ready to pay a price for that peace. So Armenian and Azerbaijani societies are not ready for the compromises. Uh, the elites, uh, the elites in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Azerbaijan, in the Armenia are not ready. Yeah, they said that they are ready for compromises, but uh, actually I think they are not. And the international community, uh, international community, I mean co-chairmanship, uh, Minsk Group, uh, Russia, uh, France or France slash European Union and, and, and United States are uh, uh, well, they, uh, they work, their work is, 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 is coordinated work, but there is, uh, they, they don't want to uh, put uh, uh, much uh, money, efforts to find a solution for the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, I do believe that the Armenians and Azerbaijanis should find the solution. I think that the uh, Americans, Europeans and Russians are not the doctors and they, they can't heal us. Uh, but from the other hand, uh, the, the support of international community is very important. And because of lack of this, uh, lack of uh, international support, uh, because elites are not ready and because, uh, uh, because societies are not ready, uh, I can't say that in the near future uh, we'll have a solution. Uh, sorry for this kind of uh, gloomy... Uh, you know, finishing, but this is the reality. Thank you, Tatum. But on the mission, um, obviously, Georgia is a neighbor of both countries, and the conflict has an impact also on your country, on Georgia, and its development. At the same time, Georgia is struggling with its own um, questions internally. Um, what is your take on the situation from a Georgia viewpoint, and which role could Georgia actually play? Positively, can we talk about this conflict resolution? Thank you for inviting me to talk Sorry, about. Sorry, before you start, maybe you should perhaps we could ask people to move forward as much as possible, and also so they can have the moment It's like this. You can, you can sit here now. Thank you. Thank you, Tatu. Okay. Thank you, Ziggy, to, for this opportunity to talk about this issue. Uh, it was 10 years ago when, uh, with Abkhazian colleagues, we Georgian journalists went to the Karabakh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, 
to make the film about the Karabakh conflict. And we thought it was important for us. And I still continue to think that it's important for Georgia, this conflict. Uh, there are some practical issues, everyday life issue affecting Karabakh conflict on Georgia's life. Uh, and there are some theoretical, political, and et, et so on. I, I, I would starting with theoretical one. There is uh, Georgia state recognized the conflict, the unresolved conflict in South Caucasus, Karabakh conflict as threat for uh, regional security and Georgia's state security. It, I, I'm trying to uh, not mention Russia, <laughs> but it, it's written there <laughs> uh, because of the conflict in uh, Karabakh. It, it's weakening, uh, weak, make the weak the uh, regional region as such, and it's make the stronger Russia's influence on on the region, which is threat for Georgia. It's written there. Um, as a citizen of Georgia, I would love to have more details about uh, reflection how the Georgian government would react on the escalation of the conflict. There is no word about that. Uh, or uh, Georgia's government or Georgia's state's uh, policy to help resolve the conflict or decrease the uh, um, possibility of escalation, but there's no word about that. It's just statement, it's mentioned two times and that's it. Uh, from another hand, Georgia has a, uh, a experience to develop some uh, work plans to implement other and to uh, reply to other conflicts like we have the occupied territory and how to uh, deal with the people uh, not only in the occupied territory, but to those who are attached to the, those territory and living there. But here we have nothing about that. So, uh, to view from the civil society initiatives, uh, uh, I would say here we have a more active position. Uh, one of these initiatives which Georgian uh, civil society also involved is the Tekali process, which is the Tekali is the uh, small village uh, on the border of the three countries. Uh, uh, mainly, um, it's uh, ethnic Azerbaijani living here. It's Georgia territory, and this is the uh, possibility. This is the. Uh, place where the Armenians and Azerbaijanis can meet and talk and discuss the different issue, development issue, democracy issue, but the conflict issue as well. Uh, the unresolved conflict also affected everyday life. I mentioned that the everyday life of Georgian citizens and the uh, one of the examples is that uh, like ethnic Armenian citizens of Georgia, they are limited to visit Azerbaijan because of ethnicity, unfortunately. I don't think that uh, ethnic uh, Azerbaijani citizens of Georgia, they are happy to, are comfortable to visit Armenia as well. So it means that we have the barriers that uh, not help the regional cooperation, uh, business development, and so on. And one of the issues which is really dangerous uh, of citizens of Georgia is the situation on the border. As you know, the, uh, the front line between uh, uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, there's no peacekeepers or any kind of uh, peace operation, and the sides are just themselves regulate the relation, ceasefire. Uh, from another hand, all this land is mined, and the, this uh, segment of the uh, Georgian Armenian border and Georgian Azerbaijani border that uh, attached to the, this uh, ceasefire line also mined. There is no sign from Georgian side, and it's it's quite dangerous. The locals are uh, 
they know that the, it's mined, but there's no sign. They only know that the, it's dangerous to go that field. Uh, there were cases when the, uh, some explosion was with the uh, any cows and so on. Mm, but uh, we have problem on that terms because uh, Georgia as a country, it's not interesting to have this minefield. Uh, more uh, than uh, there is a concept of uh, state border uh, management adopted like this year, April, uh, and it should be uh, from uh, 2014 till 2016 uh, agreed this uh, uh, border. Uh, Mm, the limitation. The limit, thank you. The limitation uh, between Georgia and Azerbaijan, Georgia and Armenia, but this part would be quite uh, uh, complicated to delimit it and then uh, managed uh, because the mind. And also, it's uh, dangerous because the uh, Azerbaijani army and the Armenian army are presented there, that uh, quite close to the border. So this is the quite practical everyday life issue. It's not like theoretical, like security concept and so on. But they are also, let's say, uh, sensitive issue because uh, uh, unresolved conflict uh, also buried the uh, regional cooperation development. For, and it's uh, affecting on the policy uh, and relation between Georgia and Azerbaijan and Georgia and Armenia. In example, uh, Azerbaijan is quite sensitive with any uh, uh, regional projects that lets Armenia develop, have communication. I would remind you the reaction of the Azerbaijani politicians when the Georgian minister stated that um, uh, about the possibility to renovate the uh, railway which comes from Black Sea coast side to the Georgia from Russia. Uh, from another hand, a uh, uh, good relation between uh, Georgia and Armenia also affected by the policy when Armenia uh, uh, voted against the uh, uh, resolution, which is important for Georgian policy, uh, resolution on IDP and refugee return. Uh, uh, of course, it's, uh, there's no direct uh, problem. Uh, I mean, uh, there is no direct policy uh, of Armenia against uh, returning of refugees uh, from Abkhazia and IDPs from Abkhazia and South Ossetia. They have nothing to uh, against it, but because of the uh, Charter Number Eight in this resolution, which is uh, which proposed uh, to include it to the resolution the text from the Guam's uh, statement, which contains uh, contains uh, themselves uh, interpretation of the uh, conflict in uh, Karabakh, uh, which is. Uh, uh, not acceptable for Armenia. So this is the reason why the Armenia votes against the resolution, which is quite sensitively uh, uh, pro, uh, sensitively re received in Georgia. So it's not theoretical things. It's also practical that the uh, unresolved conflict in uh, Karabakh affects on policy in, and everyday life in Georgia. Um, I think we put a lot of cards now on the table and. Well, also appreciating that there's so many people here, I, I would now open the floor to a few concrete questions with very concrete short answers. <laughs> um, we have a microphone um, somewhere. So, okay. I see one, two, three hands. Okay, let's then start with you, sir. Uh, my name is Rafshan, I'm from the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Azerbaijan. Um, I have a, a one short comment uh, to what Tatul said and one question to Deval, if possible. So Tatul uh, touched actually a very important question uh, and hit the nerve. Uh, the paper that you were describing uh, will have not three signatures, but four, if ever. Why? Because uh, it, it is known that 
Uh, there are two sites in the conflict, Armenia and Azerbaijan. And uh, Armenian community of Nagorno-Karabakh, just like Azerbaijan community uh, of Nagorno-Karabakh, are interested parties. This is in basic OAC documents. This is confirmed by co-chairs. This is a basic understanding. So, uh, communities of Nagorno-Karabakh will join at a stage when uh, there will be a transformation of conflict and then uh, equal rights of Azerbaijanis from expelled from Nagorno-Karabakh will be restored and then the uh, they in uh, equal and peaceful conditions will discuss what kind of self-rule arrangement they want because they are also legitimate owners of the land where they will be returning. And uh, secondly, you, you uh, described four options uh, for the resolution of the conflict. I would say, I would name the fifth one, the one proposed by co-chairs. Uh, you mentioned uh, about six principles. Uh, they envisage step-by-step -step approach. At the core of the Prague process is putting um, the most difficult questions at the end of the process. So uh, discussing and resolving the issues that can be resolved today, including the question of status. Because you cannot discuss status when you have uh, occupation, when you have troops on the ground of, uh, from Armenia, when you have uh, thousands of people uh, expelled from Nagorno-Karabakh still being IDPs. So uh, this is a reasonable approach based on a uh, phased approach. So basically, w starting with withdrawal of Armenian forces from the occupied territories, restoring uh, communications uh, on both sides, uh, restarting uh, the programs of uh, peace building and uh, cooperation, and again, transforming the conflict and allowing, uh, creating a peaceful atmosphere where at the later stage, when the sites are ready, and the conditions are ripe, the most difficult questions will be resolved. Anything short of that will be undoable, and that's obvious to everybody. So let's not deceive ourselves, okay? Uh, the reason why uh, the peace process failed at this stage, and dormant, let's be honest, is exactly because at some point in Kazan, let's uh, name it, Armenia changed the whole approach uh, to the conflict settlement that was uh, designed in Prague. Meaning, to discuss the question of status and other difficult issues at the end of the road, not in the beginning. So that's how the process failed, uh, with the demands um, uh, f from the Armenian side that has nothing to do with the model that has been discussed since 2004. And my question to Deval. Uh, you can call me Tom, it's right. We know each other. Yes. <laughs> okay. So. Can, can I have a remark? Just a remark? Mm. Let, let me ask, ask the, the question first and then. Let us see. Yeah. One sentence. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Of what? One sentence of what? No, no. My remark is okay. only one sentence. All right. After 10 minutes. So the question is about um, inflammatory. Uh, Rhetoric. Uh, everybody uh, here uh, and, and Tatu also uh, said um, about the rhetoric, and actually uh, somehow they mean only uh, only Azerbaijan when say so, whereas um, uh, you should take a look into the context of of the rhetoric uh, of continuing occupation of, of the territories of Azerbaijan. So, and I want to touch uh, the dimension of that rhetoric that often overlook. And Tabib on, only mentioned uh, a rhetoric coming from both sides. But uh, Tabib, for some reason, did not mention that there's also a rhetoric coming from third side. And that's uh, journalists, experts, who write and say um, uh, comments about, about the conflict. For example, I want to um, take the question of, uh, of the book uh, that you're about to present. Uh, one of the passages there is about the famous uh, interview that you took from Serge Sarkisian, where he explains um, why uh, they did uh, Hojali and, uh, and um, how they did it. And then you, um, after years, you said that um, quotes uh, in, in research papers, in, in the press, have been taken out of context and that you will return to the question only um, with supporting the context, as you put it. So, and uh, I have a question. Uh, so, do you mean that 
what uh, Hojali uh, can be understood if taken in the context. When you write uh, in, your, um, uh, in your articles about Ramil Safarov case, I don't remember you saying that we need to look uh, into Ramil Safarov case in the context, because it was also IDP whose relatives have been uh, killed uh, as a result of the war. So that also can be uh, informative rhetoric. Um, and when, uh, for example, you invite uh, separatists uh, from, from Nagorno-Karabakh to Washington and hold uh, a conference, uh, a meeting in, in Carnegie without inviting uh, uh, at least representatives of embassy of Azerbaijan, that can be also be considered an action that uh, leads to statements that we have to do um, in the wake of, uh, of those meetings uh, that exclude Azerbaijan. So, um, don't you think that not only Armenia and Azerbaijan, but also um, experts like you should also be careful when they uh, comment um, on, on conflict, because this will in return generate the comments on, on either, um, mostly on Azerbaijani side, explaining uh, um, and defending. And one, for example, you, in your articles, you, yes, uh, I'm, I'm finishing. In your articles, you often, uh, describe the Vic Armenia being victorious uh, in the war and Azerbaijan being defeated. This is also can be uh, said to be uh, inf inflammatory because uh, you know you cannot be victorious by expelling civilian population. Thank you. Who's going to go first? Um, you go first, please. Sure. And thank points. you, uh, Roshan. A lot of lot of points there. Um, I would describe. I mean, when I use the word victorious or defeated, I'm not attaching any moral. Wait, um, you know, when um, um, you know, there are many, I would say, for example, the ISIS has just been victorious in the town of Mosul in Iraq. That doesn't mean that I attach any moral, uh, moral weight to that, to that victory. It's just a, a fact of the battlefield. Um, thanks to the question about, about context. I think it's an important one. I think you know, we, we have to be clear um, that, you know, what we, we, we are talking as I'm talking as, as a recorder of facts, and I record quite clearly in, in, in this book Hoj, what happened in Khojali. Um, as in my view, it's, it was a, a, a war crime. When I talk about context, you know, we are, as analysts, we need to understand why these things happen. To understand is, is very different from to excuse, you know. And and so, you know, and I. In the, in the famous interview I did with Serge Sakatian, he maybe spoke a bit more than he wanted to but when he gave his explanation, but I think it's important um, to see that. You know. And of course the Armenian conception was that, was that they were under siege and they broke out of the siege and they, need, they wanted to, to, to show something in, in Khojali, which they did in, in, a, in a horrible way. Uh, Safarov, I, I, again, I, I, I attach a moral judgment to the fact that this was a man who um, killed a another man in his sleep with an axe. But also, I also understand that this is a man who grew up in a traumatized atmosphere, who in a sense grew up with this, uh, the rhetoric that I'm, that I'm talking about. So, I, un so I'm, I'm, I feel sorry for Ramil Safarov. I think he, he is also a victim of the Karabakh conflict, just as, 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 um, as Makarian, the, the man he killed in his sleep, was, was I think. You mentioned um, that I invited separatists to a conference at the Carnegie. That's not quite correct. And this is an intra-Washington debate, but I should put the, the record. I, what I did was I invited Kofi. I invited Mr. Karen Mizoyan, who represents the uh, authorities. I invited him to Kofi with a few experts, including you know, former ambassador, US ambassador to Baku. I then, this was a private meeting with some American experts. I then offered to local Azerbaijanis if they also wanted to come to a separate meeting with him, they would also be welcome, um, but they didn't take up that, that offer. I, and as an analyst, again, it's important we do not, we do not take a stand. We, we, we meet everyone who is involved. Um, we meet Abkhaz, we meet Ossetians. I, I also had them under the roof of Carnegie, and I'd be very happy to also to invite Karabakh Azerbaijanis, and maybe you can help me to have Karabakh Azerbaijanis under my roof as well. I'd be very happy to see them. Tatuli wants well, to make it. Just two, two sentences or one and a half sentences. Well, you know, uh, listening, 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 listening uh, your comments, I, I again understand that Azerbaijan wants everything or nothing. 
if you want status quo ante, the situation of 1988, this will never happen. And the half sentence you mentioned, occupation, etc., separatists, I think that Armenian side is a victorious side. <laughs> so, so um, we had already some people before. I also would like to remind you we have not that much time left. Um, people sitting here are also not officials. It's um, a number of um, experts, people with an opinion, with a strong opinion maybe. And maybe, well, we had you um, behind you. My name is Arsen Haradzian, um, former Voice of America Armenian service journalist, just moved here in Tbilisi three months ago. Um, and I'm actually very much used to hearing our Azerbaijani colleagues using every forum to very much one-sidedly present the realities. And I'm not going to use this time to do that. Just quick remark on what was said. If we're talking about sequence of events based on the principles that are being discussed, I think CMBs, confidence building measures, are an important part of it and withdrawing the snipers would be maybe a good sign to continue anything to discuss if you want, uh, if you're suggesting Karabakh and Karabakh is to live within the Azerbaijan, you may probably start, stop shooting them a little bit and so they might think twice before before they, they continue defending themselves. Uh, however, I will, I will try to have a constructive question uh, because I would like, I see a very distinct panel sitting here, um, you know, very good colleagues who have been working on this and I think sincerely trying to do stuff. Two questions. Um, considering the Armenia-Turkey failed protocol process, can we say that decoupling Turkey-Armenia relationships from Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia-Azerbaijani relationships is disingenuous nor, or, or, or maybe ineffective. And my second question is uh, about uh, the, of course, the possibility of the renewed military action. Is there any mechanism in the world that can prevent Azerbaijan from starting a war if it wanted to tomorrow? Good evening. My name is Dominik Tsagara. I am project coordinator for Caucasian House. I'm interested in regionalization processes in the Caucasus. My question is about the role of Russia in the Caucasus. Uh, we know that Armenia pledged to join the customs union and de facto Nagorno-Karabakh will become the part of the free customs zone. Um, I'm interested, uh, like I would like to direct my question to Mr. Uh, Hakopian and Mr. Husseinov. Uh, do you see this development as destabilizing or maybe on the contrary, it's a chance for a new peace settlement, like a kind of Pax Russica, similar to EU policies of Pax Europea in the Balkans. Thank you. Yeah, I am from GIPA, uh, Georgian Institute of Public Affairs. Uh, we are here, uh, Azerbaijan and Armenian students, uh, and I want to say that uh, we, you uh, can consider us uh, as a peace model of friendship and uh, negotiating together. And um, I have two questions to Mr. Ekopian. Uh, you started your solutions with uh, war and you end your speech uh, with uh, war uh, words also. Uh, I want to ask you how you uh, consider uh, in this case uh, to be a winner uh, if Azerbaijan military budget is uh, higher more than 10 times than Armenian. I have a second question that uh, about uh, periodically, we read articles about uh, Syrian refugees. Uh, we settled uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh. Armenian, yes, yes, yes. And uh, how it affects uh, peace negotiations? Actually, I, I hate this kind of atmosphere now we have, but, but anyway, I should. Well, possibility of war. There are, there are several factors which, which uh, doesn't allow Azerbaijan to begin a new war. This is my understanding. First one is that Azerbaijan is not 100% is, is, uh, is sure that, that the, uh, during the new war uh, he will win. Because when we are discussing the possibility of a new war, we should, we should understand that there are, according to my understanding, there are three ways. When uh, change of status quo, when Armenia lose Nagorno-Karabakh. The second option is that Armenia loses not only Nagorno-Karabakh, but also, let us say, Zangezur region, which is between Azerbaijan, or was between Azerbaijan and Nakhichevan. And the third option is that 
Nagorno, uh, that Azerbaijani authorities using every podium to say that they lost 40% of their territory. So there are three options. Uh, uh, the, 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 second, uh, the second is the, is the geography. Uh, when you walk along the Armenian-Azerbaijani border and the contact line, line of contact in, in, in Karabakh, Azerbaijan, you will understand that, that the positions of Armenian forces are much more better than Azerbaijanis. But the main factor that doesn't allow Azerbaijan to start a new war is that Azerbaijan is not uh, know that what, what will be the Russia's, Russia's approach. There, so there are three main factors that doesn't allow Azerbaijan to start a new war. As of a budget, you know, uh, with a budget you can't win a war. Yes, it's true that Azerbaijani budget, military budget is more than three billion, which is more than together Armenian Nagorno-Karabakh's whole budgets. But I can remind an, another example. During the first Chechen war, uh, 150 million Russians defeated in Chechnya. So the same could happen in Nagorno-Karabakh also. And as of Syrian refugees, uh, well, you know, in Armenia we have, I think, more than 10,000. And if three families are living in, in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, I don't think that uh, that is the obstacle for the negotiation process, and thank you. Yeah, I, I, according to my information, there's actually more than 30 families living in one of the occupied territories. I think it's uh, Zangalan, which I think is, is it was um, a, a very strange and rather provocative move. Um, I'm sure there's space enough for them um, in Armenia. So um, I'd just like to take up Arsene's um, question about Armenia, Turkey, and decoupling. I think in re retrospect, it was a bit naive of maybe of the Swiss and the Americans to believe it was possible uh, to achieve a decoupling of Armenia, Turkey, um, and, and Armenia, Azerbaijan in the protocols process. Um, I think, however, that the Turks also didn't know their own mind. I think the Turks disagreed with one another about, about that. Um, I think um, it's a difficult question, but I think it would have had positives if the Armenian Turkey border had, had opened, I think it would have, in the short term, I think it would have had strengthened the Armenian position at the, at the <coughs> negotiating table. But in the longer term, I think it would have actually um, been a facilitator of peace because I think it would have lifted the siege mentality in Armenia. Um, I think it would have made, the, it would have killed off the argument that Armenia is under an ex existential threat from Turks. And I think it would have focused attention, in fact, on, on, on the Karabakh conflict in, that, in the longer term and on the occupation of Azerbaijani territories. So I think Azerbaijan would have probably lost something in the short term, but I think in the, in the longer term, had it happened and would it still to happen, I think it would have a positive dynamic for the Armenian-Azerbaijani process. But as we know, that's not how things work in this region and, and, and both, both um, processes are now completely stuck, unfortunately. Considering the shortness of time, um, just one remark and I'll respond to our sense and Dominic's question as well. Uh, first remark, uh, I have been to many Armenian Azerbaijani meetings and I have to say that I'm not going to play a role here of, you know, uh, ping pong between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. So if, and I, I call to everyone uh, to avoid this kind of uh, format. Okay. When we start, it also applies to you, Tatul. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, um, Arsene's question about uh, decoupling Turkey, Armenia, Nagorno Karabakh uh, processes, I absolutely agree with uh, Tom. Uh, short remarks on this. Uh, I think, uh, besides naivety of the mediators and also on the Turkey part, there's been also a miscalculation that uh, people basically, uh, some mediators thought that they can force uh, Turkey to normalize relations uh, with Armenia at the expense of Azerbaijan. And even though, uh, you know, I also think that uh, Turkish-Armenian normalization can be potentially good for Nagorno-Karabakh process, but if that process, if that normalization between Turkey and Armenia 
is going to be at the expense of Azerbaijani Turkish relations, then it will never happen because Turkey, because of the ethnic kinship, because of the political and economic relations, will never agree to normalize relations with uh, with Armenia at the expense of Azerbaijan. So the challenge here to f is is to find a way to normalize Turkish-Armenian relations without antagonizing Turkish, uh, uh, Turkish uh, Azerbaijan relations. And how we can do this, it's, it's a bit kind of more detailed uh, response to which I'm afraid I don't have time for. Um, on preventing war uh, that Azerbaijan, uh, your second question, Arsen. Um, I think Azerbaijan would never go to war unless Azerbaijan knows that at least Russian factor is neutralized. Uh, Azerbaijan is already perhaps stronger militarily than Armenia. At least quantitatively, we can say that uh, we can we cannot measure the you know the spirit by a void uh, But uh, yes, but we, we can we can say that quantitatively approaching uh, Azerbaijan is already stronger. However, uh, there is a factor of Russia, and I think Azerbaijani political elites would never risk going to war with Armenia on a calculated way uh, unless Russian factor is taken into account. However, there is another risk here. There is a risk that uh, because of the escalation of the conflict, because of the frequent skirmishes, because of the deadlock in the negotiations, uh, even without a clear calculated action, uh, a small skirmish in the front line may, turn in, may go out of control and turn into a bigger conflict in which then Russia would have to be intervened, Azerbaijani ally Turkey would have to be intervened. Uh, and that would be a disaster not only for, again, Armenian and Azerbaijani peoples, but also for Russian interests in the region, Turkish interests in the region, and broader Western in interests in the region. On, and that also leads me to Dominic's question uh, on Russian role. Um, Russia, again, I'm, I'm not a Russia bashing person. I, I think, and uh, maybe it's not a very popular thing to say in the Georgian audience, uh, Georgian dominated audience. But you know, if we look at uh, the role of Russia, the, Russia is actually playing, uh, there are lots of negative things, but also the only achievement that we have in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict so far, that's the ceasefire, has been brokered by Russia. Uh, the basic principles have been, uh, most of the negotiations uh, under the basic principles have been led by Russia, uh, with the support and assistance from uh, uh, from the European Union, uh, particularly France and the United States. Uh, so Russia is not always a negative factor when it comes to Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. It was clearly a negative factor in Georgia, it was clearly a negative in Ukraine, but it's not always a negative factor, a negative player when it comes to Nagorno-Karabakh context. As to Customs Union, uh, we've heard this uh, statement from President of, Nazar uh, President of, of Kazakhstan, Nazarbayev, uh, technically, Armenia is not going to enter into customs union together with Nagorno-Karabakh, but uh, they had similar questions uh, when they were entering WTO. Uh, they entered technically WTO with the Republic of Armenia, but uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and adjacent territories are factically incorporated into Armenian political space. So I don't think that uh, that will be a big, uh, I don't think that it's, it's, a, it's an obstacle for Armenia or for Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians. Uh, definitely Nagorno-Karabakh, the product that is being made in Nagorno-Karabakh will be labeled Armenia, made in Armenia and will be sold in Russian market or in the Eurasian Union market. Uh, I don't think that it has a negative impact or positive impact. The only impact it has is that Russia uh, incorporates Armenia more and more into its integrative structures. Armenia becomes more and more dependent on Russia. Uh, and it's a, I, I would say it's a conscious choice by Armenian political elites. Maybe that will disagree with me, but it's a conscious choice uh, because Armenia sees Russia as the primary security provider. And that's uh, as long as they consider Arme uh, Rus uh, Russia as a primary security provider, they will abide by Russian kind of uh, initiatives. They, they, will, they will follow Russian, uh, Russian initiatives and will be part of it. Um, so that's, that's kind of my answer to, to your question.
So, my name is Levonis Sakhanyan. Uh, I have a question with regard to the collision between the right to self-determination and the principle of territorial integrity in international public law. Uh, it is interesting, especially in the light of the ICJ International uh, Court of Justice advisory opinion on Kosovo's unilateral declaration of independence. The court, International Court of Justice, mentioned in its opinion that there is no any applicable international public law provision which limits declaration of independence by any part of any state. So I would like to ask you, uh, Mr. Deval, about your position with regard to this opinion of the International Court of Justice. I would like to comment, if it's allowed, uh, yeah, very short comment, uh, on what was said with regard to Safarov case and the contextualization of Safarov case. Uh, of course, you mentioned that one should contextualize when we are talking about specific case. And uh, how do you uh, imagine? And uh, this is not the question only to you personally, but to the Azeri authorities in general. Uh, the Armenians living in the context of a state where if a soldier kills a sleeping Armenian, then he becomes a hero and uh, state, the whole nation supports him and he is being given specific like uh, apartment and salary for eight years, etc. And uh, my uh, last question, very, very short one. Uh, the representative of Azeri uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs mentioned that they are separatists and uh, that uh, this territory is under the Armenian occupation. Would you say the same with regard to Turkey, which has been occupying part of the European Union, the part of Cyprus state since more than 20 years, 30 years? Thank you. I'm Mamuk Adolidze from uh, Writers Union of Georgia uh, and Tbilisi State University, professor of Tbilisi State University. I would like to re I would like to remind you the opinion of Merat Mamar Dashvili, who told me that the um, globally Soviet pressure of ideological global pressure now changed its face and individual and uh, instead of instead of global conflicts we have the conflicts between individuals between individual groups and nations so this conflict is the changing face of uh, global Soviet Soviet pressure ide ideological pressure it was the Mamardashvili's idea and uh, my idea it coincides with his, his opinion that in this case we have also some some continuation of this Soviet ideological conflict, but it changed its face and instead of global political project we have some individual conflicts between the nations. So my question is, do you think that it is an artificial escalation of outstanding and external political forces here, or we have the national develop uh, natural development of internal conflict between the nations? Я, меня зовут Гурам Архули, я историк Сухумского государственного университета, я из Абхазии, тоже люди из, из, как его, с Армении, с Азербайджана, я очень рад, что сегодня я вижу рядом, вместе они находятся, ну и не знаю, чья заслуга господина Томаса или не знаю, но очень приятно, что эти люди могут договориться и в конце концов эта проблема на Корного Карабаха, наверное, исчезнет. Но я не думаю, что это вы. Решите, я не думаю, потому что в 1919 году тоже Англия была председателем конференции грузино-армянской, и Ларийская область сегодня находится в территории Армении. Вот как вы помогли нам тогда. Сейчас у меня один вопрос к вам. Вот вы написали книгу там «Черный сад», да? Я не понял. Причину, причину, вот. В чем причина войны в Карабахе? Армяне и азербайджанцы жили да, вместе. Это этническая проблема или геополитическая? И как вы выйдете в коне... Ну, российская, это, ну, как он знает. В конечном итоге, как этот вопрос вообще решится? Ваше мнение интересно. I will not give back Lori to Georgia because I am from Lori. <laughs> okay. Um, right, and, and I'll say that, yes, I think 
the, the British ended the war, Armenian-Georgian war, but I don't think the British drew the frontier in Lori. Um, um, Mr. Professor Dolidze asked a very interesting question, philosophical question, but I'm, a, I'm not sure I completely understood it. I think there was an interesting idea there which I didn't completely understand. Um, um, maybe we can talk afterwards. I, I, I do think you mentioned the Soviet ideology. I do think it's important to remember this was a conflict which began in Soviet times, which, and that the Soviet, a Soviet mentality, unfortunately, programmed the beginning of the conflict in the sense that Soviet Armenians and Soviet Azerbaijanis didn't know how to talk to each other. They only knew how to talk to Moscow. They asked Moscow to arbitrate the conflict. Um, and they didn't have mechanisms of dialogue uh, with each other in 1988. Uh, they both appealed to Gorbachev to say, who does Karabakh belong to? And they were both disappointed uh, with Gorbachev. Um, Levon Isakhadian asked about the ICJ thing. For me, that was a very strange verdict. It basically said everyone has a right to declare independence. I mean, Scotland has a, rep um, but then it, it completely ducked the important question about what is the mechanism of granting a new territory uh, independence. And um, as we know, Kosovo went through that mechanism in a very long and painful way over many years. I think, in my view, it should have been even longer and more painful. I think we shouldn't exclude separatism in this world, but I think we should make it very difficult. That's my, that's my view. Um, and Vash Vapros. Uh, uh, <laughs> Сначала хочу сказать, читайте книгу, вам будет интересно. Во-вторых, хочу сказать, что, конечно, это был конфликт, который, по которому воевали по этническому принципу, но это этнический принцип, это не корный конфликт. Корный конфликт в том, что заложена была проблема советской системы, что была автономная область в одной союзной республике, Азербайджан, которая имела сильно провязанность к другой союзной республике эм, Армении. Кстати, был второй случай в советской системе, назывался Крым, который недавно взорвался. Эм, и, значит, это проблема безопасности, что об, обе стороны э, чувствовали себя не безопасность небезопасно не в отношении э, друг к другу э, э, карабахские ар, э, армяне в отношении Азербайджана, а Азербайджан в отношении э, внутри своей республики этот очаг э, армян. Это, это вкратце э, причина, но, пожалуйста, читайте книгу. Спасибо, <coughs> Thank you very much to the panelists um, for your time. Thank you, audience, for the debate. Um, I would say it was a... It was another example that this is a very sensitive and very emotional topic. Um, I think we managed to accommodate this diversity of opinion somehow, and there's enough space to continue this, um, not only today, but well, there will be more of these um, occasions, we hope. Now I kindly invite you, in the name of um, Conciliation Resources and the EPNK partnership, to go to the second floor in the reception hall, where we have the official presentation of the book, uh, a reception, and there's also a photo exhibition on Nagorno-Karabakh. Thank you very much. New edition in Russian of Tom Deval's book, Black Garden. I would now kindly ask Tom to give a few, well, to give us a few insights about this book, why he decided to publish it again. Um, it was one of the initiatives of Conciliation Resources to support this second edition in Russian with a new introduction and conclusion, since we are interested in um, producing new ideas, creating fresh thought and provoking and also challenging narratives. Um, Tom, maybe 
despite this situation, you can it, you have to talk into both. Okay, I, talk, I have to talk in. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very glad to be here uh, in the National Library in Tbilisi, um, and also I'm glad to be surrounded by the photographs of these two gentlemen next to me um, who actually photographed the Karabakh conflict. I, I was not there during the actual conflict, I was only there after the conflict um, and so I think it's important to be reminded of the human face of the conflict that you see uh, in these pictures around you. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time, um, I, I think um, we have maybe some more important things to do, um, to talk to each other and to, and to celebrate a little. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Conciliation Resources for sponsoring the Russian edition of this book um, in an incredibly short time, in a new edition, which means that it can be accessible to more people, uh, particularly in the region, uh, who don't read in English. I think that's very important. Um, I received, um, when the first edition came out in English and then in Russian um, and then also in Armenian Azari. I received a, lo a lot of negative criticism which was to be expected. This is a, uh, a conflict which for many people in the region is a very kind of sacred issue. I was touching on their holy ground, um, that's to be understood. Uh, but I'm glad to say I also got some positive comments. I got letters, I even got one letter from Australia uh, which particularly touched me. It was from a um, someone who came from Baku, he had a mixed Armenian Azerbaijani parentage. He'd had to, f to flee his hometown um, and he'd ended up in Australia and he said, uh, thank you for writing the book. Um, um, my whole world was turned upside down by this conflict. My whole world was destroyed. I lost the Baku of my childhood. Uh, the world was divided um, and I thought I'd gone mad but your book confirms to me it wasn't me who'd gone mad, it was the others, the people who destroyed my world, who, who were the mad ones. And that, that was a nice letter that I got. Um, there's very little to add about the new edition. It just, um, um, maybe I was sort of um, crazy enough to embark on this project when I was a bit younger, the idea to write a, a book about the Karabakh conflict from both sides. Um, it involved an enormous amount of travel. Um, I remember looking down when I was in Karabakh and um, seeing lights of Azerbaijani villages and realizing that it, for me to reach those villages which were just a few miles away would take many many days of a journey and I certainly covered a lot of miles going back and forth uh, writing this book um, and I, I said I, I jokingly said I was discovering symptoms of schizophrenia in myself because half of my brain was uh, looking at the Azerbaijani side and half was looking at the Armenian side. Um, but I think there was a, we felt there was a need to update the book um, because it was still being read um, but it was now out of date. So the book brings uh, the conflict up to 2012 um, and also adds a few uh, conclusions. Um, but my conclusions are basically the same. My conclusions are really that this is a a conflict which had its own tragic logic. It was a conflict that no one needed, but um, um, had its own tragic logic at the end of the Soviet period. Um, and that the two societies are still living, more or less, in 1988. They're still, their minds are still in that period of 1988. Um, one day that mentality will change, and I think the day that mentality changes is maybe the day that we will begin to see real progress. I think, for me, progress will begin when a psychological moment is reached. The psychological moment will be when the two sides decide that they, they can't defeat each other, that they cannot destroy each other, um, but they have an option to build something together. They have an option to, to be neighbors again, to try and build something in common and try and work together to solve this problem. Um, we still not haven't reached that psychological moment. It may not come for many years to come. Uh, it may be, you know, hopefully not another 20 years, but it, it could even be more than that. Um, but I, I do believe um, that that moment will come sooner or later. Um, and sooner or later, this conflict will also be become a historical conflict to be read about in schools and universities rather than lived every day by uh, Armenians and Azerbaijanis. So um, with that, thank you all for coming. Um, and it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.